Thank you very much, Dominique. So we've now heard all of our perspectives. What I'd like to do is ask the panelists to, who are physically in the room if they could come back up uh, to the front. So um, Sonny and Catherine and Dominique. Uh, and if Phil and Diane are able to stay on the line with us so that if questions and such come up. Um, we have about 45 minutes, I think, for discussion. Um, and I'm intrigued by a lot of the things that got said here and uh, we'll, we'll pose some questions in a second to get us started, but then I'm really more interested in getting uh, your questions. Clearly we heard about the importance of structures, of things like extension and um, peer review as a way of, of vetting. The importance of leadership, uh, I think that came a lot out of uh, a couple of these talks of people who are committed to, to outreach. The importance of institutional support through things like uh, PIO offices, granting some challenges there, but that that's also a useful uh, structure. Um, institutional support for things like training. We also heard about the importance of incentives, uh, both as friction and as momentum. Uh, incentives like uh, peer review, a disincentive being the amount of time, uh, the potential for business, the amount of time it takes, business success, um, this, the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, rewards. But the thing that struck me the most was that almost every speaker used the word trust. That came up over and over and over again. At, at first, Phil just said, in God we trust, but he later on talked about the students as being uh, people who were trusted in the community. And that really um, addressed an issue that actually connects very strongly to the issues of control that, that Catherine brought up. Uh, in 1963, Frederick Seitz, who was then uh, president of the National Academies, wrote a letter to Science Magazine in which he said, quote, Science is attempting to, he was very concerned about public discussion that was appearing in the, in the uh, news pages of Science Magazine. He said, science is attempting to establish policy by means of an extensive open debate through editorials and letters in which the scientific community is invited to express whatever views, extreme or otherwise, individuals may have. One wonders if AAAS would not render a greater service to the country by creating a body which would attempt to review the in opinions of individual scientists in a constructive way and then use the pages of science to summarize, uh, summarize the results of these deliberations after they've been digested. He was concerned about trust in science. The AAAS board discussed this and quite ringingly came back out with a statement that science and democracy both flourish uh, with, with open debate. But that it meant that that issues of, of having this openness, and, and that came up very much in one of the things that Sonny said, and that's actually where I want to start out, is that, Sonny, you said um, that it was important to have, to, for, to have communication as part of the process right from the beginning, so that as issues come up, they would already be part of the discussion. And I presume that that includes issues of potential public concern or uh, opposition or regulatory issues. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what you mean by that and how that ability to be part of the process is part of the uh, building trust. Be sure to push the red, the speak button. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Bruce. And, and uh, what I meant by engaging our communications colleagues in the conversations by, with scientists right from the word, from the inception of the ideas being developed is oftentimes what happens is the work is already done, we go ahead and publish a paper or something like that. And, and to Catherine's point as well, now you're caught uh, maybe saying something that goes against the grain or maybe the discovery was not what was expected, you know, based on the hypotheses developed and things like that. But having communications folks right at the front end really helps you uh, have them help you develop a better appreciation for the potential impacts that might occur as well. And, and in my experience, you know, we, we started doing this when I was at Purdue University, was to have uh, communications specialists sit in as, like, you know, flies on the wall as it were almost, but actually as it, it turned out, they started asking 
uh, questions because they had no preconceived notions about the science that was being uh, done. So they could, in quotes, ask stupid questions and get away with it, right? And, and really, it helps tremendously from that perspective of having our communications specialists really be part of the conversation because I think they can really help us all, you know, avoid getting into trouble or avoid uh, the public misinterpreting and misperceiving what's being uh, stated. Catherine, I mean, there's obviously the implications for there of being not just working through the PIO office, but journalists being able to be um, part of the process to be able to, to come in early, not just when they have a question. But does that, are you seeing evidence of some of that problem of journalists not being able to get through, not just when they want to have a question, but when they want to participate or observe the process of science? before their results are, are produced. Does that fit? Um, I'm seeing problems all along. I mean, at, 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 at any, any point you're trying to, uh, to get in to look at the process, uh, because we can't talk to people uh, in a normal fashion. Now, uh, I am appreciative of the laws that require open meetings that often can give a journalist an eye, a background on what is going on uh, before they have to get into the details with an individual scientist. Bruce? Hmm. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Th is that Phil? Um, yes. Go ahead, Phil. My, con my, my, my concern is uh, confusion. So, for example, there are m parents who don't let their kid get a vitamin K injection um, because of seeing something online. There are parents who aren't taking vaccines because of, you know, uh, you, don't, you really have to have balanced input that people could understand. And there's so much stuff out there. So the lack of understanding, uh, the point I made before, uh, when you use chondroitin and glucosamine or dietary supplements, there's so much stuff out there, and yet double-blind placebo trials say it's not better than placebo. So getting it out early, uh, people may anchor on it, and it would be far superior, I mean, there could be nothing better than an NRC study. Now, that may be a long way off, but I, I, I'm worried about the public doesn't have, the public is not usually scientifically literate. They don't know the meaning of a control. They don't know the meaning of a dose. I've heard some people think that one in a billion of some contaminant is worse than one in a million. So it, it's a question if you get it out early, it may lead to a lot of confusion. Don't we, do any of the people that you've talked to worry about that aspect of using social media, that they're putting stuff out there that may be misinterpreted, and particularly if it's early in their research process? Well, again, this, is, this would be anecdotal evidence, and I, so I cannot really give you a definite answer. Uh, what I think, though, is that uh, it's clear from our results that there is a personal interest in actually communicating the research, so that's for clear. The reason why they do so, I will have to go more in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the data, but to go back to what Sonia has said, though, I think uh, it's an important point, and it confirms what uh, Katie was saying, too, is that the idea that communication professionals are, are uh, right away you know, impl uh, you know uh, collaborator in, in that process. For me, I mean, as far as uh, the social media activities are for those scientists, my concern is that often there is actually not a, a clear understanding of the potential ways this can uh, make <coughs> backfire. And that's, uh, that's something I think that if we think in terms of training for scientists, I think that it should be really clearly communicated. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is definitely the qualitative interviews we've done in another topic that's for nuclear power, and so it's very different. Uh, there's a clearly like the perception from scientists that if they're not vocal, somebody else will. 
So to, to actually say that indeed we shouldn't talk because it may backfire is also dangerous because if you don't talk, somebody else will talk for you. And then once, you know, communication 101 and PR 101, when the floor is taken, very hard to take it back. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's that uh, friction about, you know, we need the presence uh, to, you know, we need vo vocal, you know, scientists because other potential groups will be vocal if not. I also want to be sure that if people in the room have questions, um, please feel free to go to the mics. We are beginning to get a couple of comments in uh, through, the, through the comments box and, and Twitter. While those are collecting, let me also ask uh, an, a place where there was a little bit of tension, I think, although I'm not sure, between Dominique's data and Diane's data uh, about the, whether there's a switch at the point when you become tenured, whether they're really, whether the young, people are, are really sort of being told don't be involved and afterwards there it becomes okay. Dominique's data goes differently. Di Diane, do you want to comment on that, whether you saw that as a... Well, as a I, I would say, uh, well, they're different data sets, so um, we can probably come up with a lot of different reasons they might be different. Um, I think the most important thing is to distinguish what's being tweeted. and. I would say my argument would be, and at least what we heard, and this goes to the, the discussion shortly uh, before this question, um, you know, I, we didn't meet a whole lot of scientists, scholars, who were enamored of the idea of just throwing it out there before they had been able to vet it internally. Um, be it through email or a, a brown bag launch or a small invited conference. There, that's why I, I went to the sharing uh, question. Um, there was a pretty consistent pattern about what you would share with whom. Um, so I think maybe uh, Dominique and I are, we may be comparing apples and oranges. It's one thing to tweet the paper you just published or the dissertation you just got out there, that final archival product versus the, the sausage making in the process of getting to that final product. I think people are very concerned about being misinterpreted. Um, we have an interesting quote, you know, somebody in Cash Kent gets a hold of this uh, early uh, paper and I get misquoted for the rest of my life. Um, so I, I, that it's perhaps what we're talking about being broadcast with social media um, and with regards to age. I, I, I would say that there wasn't a graduate student or postdoc that we talked to, and I did a lot of informal asking young scholars, um, oh, are you going, you know, do you talk about this stuff? Do you, do you publish this on your blog? or? Um, Facebook or whatever it is, and it was pretty, it was unanimous. No, uh, not until I get my dissertation finished. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that, I, 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 sorry, I, I would agree that indeed it depends what you're sharing, and, uh, and, but uh, I would actually, you know, suggest that maybe things are changing among the younger generation with things such as uh, ResearchGate and all the other, you know, online communities that focus on specific research disciplines where there's a, you know, people ask feedback about different questions and, you know, they can ask questions to peers in their own discipline and that's beginning quite active among younger generations. To respond to the first question related to, uh, you know, know if uh, tenure has an impact or not. In our regressions here, but again, when talking about University of Wisconsin, and uh, we'd be very careful in not generalizing because the culture of my institution may be very different as far as was uh, considered appropriate for public communication. We control for uh, what we call the uh, academic age which is a year since PhD, you know, and, uh, and that ha didn't have a statistically significant effect on the likelihood to communicate through social media about their research. So, and again, you know, like, I think we're not, that's why we focus specifically on social media and media. We're not talking about going to a science museum or things that may actually take a lot of time. We're talking about really like communication activities that are uh, more, uh, you know, you can do at night in, uh, in your living room while watching the Packers lose again. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 actually, let me take back, they, they won. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, but the, the 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 point is though is that I think this these communication activities they are perceived as taking time but they're not as time constraining that others and uh, from a quick uh, analysis of my data because we just finished collecting it I could see that one of the main uh, you know constraints that uh, our scientists see is really time they don't have time and time is the most valuable resource in academia we would like to do a lot of things that we don't because we don't have time thank you. Question, Jack? Hi, I'm Jack Schultz from the University of Missouri, and it, Missouri is just as Phil described it. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about the, uh, the data on contact with media. Uh, I think this flew right by me. You, you selected that population how? So the population was uh, based on the publications in PubMed. So basically, we look at the people that had published the, the former two years in PubMed and actually a census of all the, uh, uh, the authors. And we came up with like, um, I mean, I can, do you have all the supplemental material in the science uh, article? And then basically, we wanted to have, you know, the idea was to actually be able to, co to, uh, to compare countries, but not based on data that are provided by institutions in each country, because already that would be biased, but based on some kind of sampling frame that we can add, uh, add up for each country. And then we actually build a, a data set of all the authors that came up with uh, uh, this approach, and then we did a random sample through this. Okay, so you didn't filter by journal? No. Oh, okay, I, I misheard. I thought you, you selected from certain journals. No, no, at all. No. no, okay. All right, because some journals have higher contact rates with media. That's so. exactly why we didn't. Good point. <laughs> Sunny, do you, do you have any um, sense of how you, you, men, you mentioned new media uh, and all of the ways in which Extension is starting to use them? Do you have any sense of how the people in, in NIFA are? The scientists are responding to that. That is, it, is it just the communication staff and the extension staff, or of course, extension people often have a research component. So, what? How do they understand that balance? Yeah, you know, uh, to uh, Dominique's uh, point as well. There's a, you know, obviously we provide funding to folks at the University of Wisconsin as well. <laughs> so there's, there's two separate <laughs> uh, things to the, the question that you ask, uh, Bruce. In terms of the scientific community that's uh, around the country, uh, you know, they're every bit as hip to use of social media as the sample size that uh, Dominique was uh, referring to as well. And uh, the, the question that, and so an, an extension particularly has taken social media as a way to communicate because you've got, for example, and, and the folks that do the applied research and extension yeah. as well, uh, in part because you've got farmers and livestock producers and others that are you know, signed on to uh, receiving tweets, and uh, it might be the occurrence of the spotted ring drosophila that's happening right now, or the marmorate extinct bug that's happening right now, or a weed, or maybe it's about a particular weather event that needs to result in some uh, approach to dealing with a, a problem that you've got. So there really, there's a lot of interactions that are going on from that perspective is, uh, um, people sign up and, and they receive tweets and they're able to trigger responses as well. So those are a couple of things that, uh, that you see in the sort of the world that we provide funding for. Mm -hmm. Will? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, Bill Prorine from DuPont here. Uh, I'm curious as you think about this, how do you reconcile quality versus quantity? So sometimes, you know, as people are out there, they're wanting to make a name for themselves or they're trying to raise money for a particular small company or what have you. How do you deal with that, and, and uh, maybe I tie it back to a specific data point, is it all, is it necessarily bad, it may be actually good that we discourage younger people from communicating too, too aggressively while they actually improve maybe their quality parameters? I'm not saying they're all quality bad from the beginning, but how do you struggle with pushing quantity versus quality, and how do you, how do you look for what quality means to you in your work? <laughs> so, uh, you know, in my previous life as an academic and uh, having managed the agricultural research programs at Purdue University and also <coughs> the dean at, at Oregon State University, one of the things that we started talking about was really this quality versus quantity, particularly in relation to social media. And uh, so um, f there's a group that was responding to uh, the issue of uh, 
resistance occurring in insects that are you know, feeding on uh, genetically modified corn, for example. And rather than going ahead, sort of a knee-jerk reaction of putting out these tweets or whatever else, that there might ought to be a, cu a curator. And so we made the conscious decision that there's got to be a curator that can go ahead and, and maybe look at it one pass, as it were, before it's actually tweeted out. And so the communications group then went ahead and it's another set of eyes that's looking at it, as it were. So I think that curation part of it, you know, really I, I'm very concerned as well that when we have this sort of a opportunity to start tweeting and posting, you know, blog posts or whatever else, that we don't have a, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the world of publications that Diane was talking about, there's the review process, there's multiple eyes that look at these things. And in the new media world, in the social media world, you may not have that set of eyes that's looking at it, and it might indeed end up being, uh, you know, something that you didn't want to tweet, and it's now you're, you've done it, and somebody's now picked it up. It's been retweeted as well. And, and so, in fact, that's why I, I keep saying that in having our communications experts really help in, in that sort of a curatorial uh, process is very helpful from my perspective. Does that run into the control issue that Catherine's concerned about? Catherine? You know, it's hard to, to visualize exactly what you're talking about. But yes, I would be concerned. I, if, if you say, uh, well, don't tweet anything until the communications department can see it. I, mm -mm, <laughs> I don't like it. Um, so that's much of it. You know, so I, I didn't mean to say that it's going to be held up by the communications department until somebody blesses it, as much as there's a set of eyes that's looking at it. You know, obviously there are some controversial uh, things that, particularly in academic uh, circles, you might have uh, uh, being written about and published as well. So let's say that it's the Endangered Species Act and somebody's discovered something to do with the endangered species uh, or a particular endangered species and there's a decision that needs to be made about uh, whether it's water or use of a particular class of pesticides or whatever. And, and having the, somebody else look at it really helps, uh, you know, not to, you know, uh, censor it to uh, Catherine's point. but. I've seen way too many uh, things come out without some sort of a vetting. And, and the reason that for all of these decades where we've had a publication process when you submit a, uh, an article for peer review, the process it goes through, you're getting this feedback and you're improving it, has been there and served a yeoman's uh, a service for all of us. And in this new media world, we have to kind of figure out where that balance is between censorship and where you want to clean it up and, and make sure that the data are indeed pointing in the direction. Otherwise, you get, you know, the old gigo, garbage in, garbage out. Phil, do you want to add a perspective? Your sense of well, I, both, I, both I, from academia and business? No? I think it's all been said. Um, I, I don't have anything new to add to what, what's been commented. Okay. Um, you, um, you just care with the message that goes out. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I wouldn't let the quality control only be the uh, public relations department unless they had really relevant skills so uh, that they really understand the issues and the risk and how big they are. I would run into trouble with lawyers who, uh, you, you know, you want a lawyer who doesn't have a file, so they, they can't send a message to the file that they disagreed or they're always conservative. So it's just a strong conservative influence without a technical background is a bad, is a bad screen. Okay, thank you. Tony, did you have something? Well, it, the thing that I, I'd like to point out, though, is like we need to, to some extent, think forward, I mean, the, the, the models are changing, even peer review has changed, and when you think about social media and potential impact on, on, uh, on peer review, uh, you know, it reminds me that uh, case study with the arsenic-eating bacteria, 
published initially in science and a very healthy debate that happened in the blog sphere, they end up, you know, like scrutinizing that article in a way that hadn't been possible with the, the, the traditional view of peer reviewing. So also that whole idea of quality control to some extent, it, the raise upon a what quality are we talking about? The quality of peer review article that may actually benefit from more scrutiny? I mean, I'm just saying that, the, you know, we shouldn't always think that only bad things happen in those social media environments. It may also be good, good for scientists, good for studies, good for, you know, the construction of scientific knowledge. Just, just so, foot on the table. Okay. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, just, I just want to add, I mean, I think, you know, there's sort of a, an either or type yeah, of a context that's being developed. Yeah. It's all context driven. Yeah. Okay. And, and depending on the context that you're in and to Phil's comment as well, you know, you might want to engage <coughs> attorneys and others as well. I mean, it really it, it depends on, on where you are at and the context and things like that. But, but I think this, this quality versus quantity is a very critical thing that we all need to be mindful of and be also concerned about the censorship issues as well. Fred? Yeah. So I guess I just wanted to identify yourself for people. Fred Gould, uh, North Carolina State University. I come from a land-grant college, and Sonny and I were just talking about that. I, I just wanted to get to the point of we've been talking mostly, at least, focusing on communication of scientists communicating to the public and talking about reward being in terms of careers and stuff. But the other thing, I guess, I, especially in extension, there's this big component of new ways of knowing that you get from the public. So uh, people's careers, I know, in, in extension have been changed by insights into the science that a farmer would have because of the way they're doing it. And I'm just wondering about the blogging in that same way. You know, how many scientists' careers have been affected in terms of learning new things that change the trajectory of their research? And I was talking to Sonny about this just in the sense of it would be interesting to do that survey to ask those people, yeah, how often have you been impacted by knowledge you got from the blogging? It, it, certainly historically, there are a number of examples of scientists before, before social media who learned about something important for their science through the process of having read it in uh, a media story. Um, there's some stuff in plate tectonics. There's some stuff in some, I think it was aerodynamics. I have an example somewhere in my drawer. But Dominique, you wanted to say something about that? Well, no, I just was uh, going to point out to the research that you and I actually, you know, uh, conducted at Cornell University with the Lab of Ornithology based on all the citizen science type of approach. And, you know, where ornithology basically relies on data, you know, given by all the citizens. You cannot put the science behind every bird in America and in the world, obviously. Astronomy being another one. And actually, in this context, for example, in all the disciplines that do rely on this kind of, uh, you know, uh, approach, it would, social media is particularly interesting so point well taken that would be an interesting research question diane did any of your conversations uh, bear on that topic you know i'm having a little difficulty hearing you guys um oh, i can hear the people calling in remotely but if you want to repeat it then maybe i can so i can respond the the question from fred gould was are there we know from the that there are examples in the extension system of extension people whose work was deeply influenced by the public interactions they had, such as an, an insight that a farmer gave them of, that led them to think about their research in a different way or about their topic in a different way. And the question is whether that blogging or other kinds of social media are having any kind of similar effect if we're starting to see any examples of scientists who are getting insight into their own work from interactions on social media. Well, I, I think even more broadly, uh, with not even having to focus on social media, um, I mean, again, how you define social media, um, we heard a lot from scholars who uh, said just the Internet, be it an email, having papers posted online, opened up a whole audience for their work. Um, and uh, not only K-12 kids, but people from all over the world who then they would interact with. And yes, I think that there was generally a sense of, of those interactions being very positive. Okay, thanks. Daniel? Daniel Colón Ramos, yeah, we, University. Uh, we really didn't hear a lot about people blogging. Okay. Um, you know, it's one thing, it's, it's one question about blogs 
created by people who are not active researchers. That's a different realm, I think. Um, the question, I, I guess, is, uh, and looking at Dominique's data, um, there's a very small slice, maybe it's growing, but there's still a very small slice of people employing these tools. Um, so uh, I think it just complicates the picture and, and calls for more good data, more empirical data um, about the, the range and, and effect of those particular tools. Okay, um, thanks. So I've been given a five-minute signal, just so you know where we are in the process. <laughs> Daniel? <laughs> Daniel Conor Ramos, Yale University. I, I follow a bunch of scientists via Twitter, and one of the scientists that tweet, and I was wondering if in the research that was done, uh, the questions distinguish between tweeting of pre-published content and tweeting of post-published content, because in my experience, wh while the debate is very interesting, like, frankly, I haven't seen a lot of pre-published content as the concerns have, that are being raised are mostly about that, but I think scientists are very well trained in that aspect. I will argue, I'm sure there are exceptions, but I will argue because of conferences and talks that turns out in practice not to be very common. I, and and um, I have seen, actually, I have seen scientists that tweet about their day-to-day -day life in the lab, but it's not about data. It's about technical aspects of their experiments, which is really interesting, too. But I was, yeah, it, does the research distinguish? Well, actually, uh, the research that I'm talk uh, I just presented, we didn't, uh, we just actually asked them when they were tweeting about their research, but uh, we didn't actually ask them if they were doing pre or post. But I, will, I would agree with you. Again, anecdotal evidence, most of the time they do it post-publication, but it might be after post-conference. So it depends what you call publication, too. So we are using, you know, intelligent algorithm to actually assess uh, the census of the data on social media related to a specific topic. That would certainly a question that would be interesting to investigate. Mm -hmm. Sonny? Yeah, if I might add to Daniel's question or comment, I guess. The other issue with pre-publication tweeting about data and all that is also it compromises your ability to uh, protect your IP, you know? Yeah. And, and a lot of universities now are all about protecting IP. And so there's, there's a lot of concerns from that pers uh, perspective being expressed as well. So we have a question that's come in uh, online that I think is really relevant. A lot of our discussion has been about te rewards and incentives associated with tenure or people who are in uh, formal agency positions. And the, the comment from Richard O'Grady at American Institute of Biological Sciences is non-tenure track positions are increasing. So what do we know about the sharing or communication behavior of people when tenure is not at stake, although short-term contracts may be. That's the, I'm, I'm adding that. Um, short-term contracts and therefore judgment. Is that any sense of how that might be changing the world uh, given what we know about the changes in the science um, labor market? Anybody want to take that on? The only thing I can tell you is that we didn't find statistical, you know, significant evidence that actually that tenure track made a difference in people's behavior as far as communicating the science. So, you know, I assume from that that we cannot really uh, feel that the patterns would be different between those two groups. Okay. Last question, Rick. If you know, oh, um, Phil, go ahead, Phil. Phil. Uh, there's an elephant in the room. Uh, my concern much greater about young faculty is that the average R01 entry level grant in the NIH is now at about 41 or 42 years of age. So uh, these young people walk in quite late in their career, uh, and it changes the whole risk profile. Uh, and, and so the urgency with which they move forward is already so. Uh, so compromised. It, it's, it's a real concern. I think tenure is always going to be measured around scientific merit. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it is now big science. I, I'm talking about biomedical, the area I know. <clears throat> and how are they going to achieve their identity in big teams in a relatively short time? 
And I'm worried when you're that old and you want to think about a house and children and a car, you take different kinds of risks. So uh, to me, that's the big elephant in the room. Yeah, it's definitely one um, to consider. I so I want to ha take time for, for one last question, hopefully a short one with short answers, or we'll just take the question and then let it be the spark for coffee break conversation. Want to so, do it that way, Rick? I'll try. <laughs> so it's Rick Borschalt, Department of Energy, and one of the roundtable members. And it's a follow-up sort of on what the Twitter community you're looking at between scientists who are tweeting is. And it gets to some of Catherine's concerns, too. You, your data may not fully explicate this, but my sense is that these are people who are tweeting to other scientists, and it's virtually a closed system. And I really don't know that this is public communication at all in the sense we're talking about. I don't think many of the reporters that Catherine's concerned about are part of that Twitter communication and Twitter, Twitter universe. Actually, you raise a great point, Rick, because when I was thinking that we should uh, rethink how we think, this is one of those you know, examples where like, the barriers that we use to put between different communities actually don't exist in the online environment. Anybody can find whatever they want when they they look for it as long as they use the right keyword and they, you know, they start the right search. Tweeting is actually totally public. You know, like you can find any tweet that you want compared to, to Facebook where you actually have, you know, like a privacy tool. So whoever, even if you tweet to your colleagues, anybody can find your tweet and indeed that has posed problems for some people that tend to forget the public visibility of Twitter. I'm sure you can think of any, a lot of example in the entertainment community, right? Uh, so, so, <laughs> right, exactly. So like basically even if you are tweeting with your colleagues and that's true, people tend to have followers and such, you do have a hashtags that actually open up to anybody that's interested in the topic. For example, right now, you know, hashtag NIS interface is actually accessible to everybody. And so to some extent, I think that notion that even if you think you tweet into your own community, is actually a false notion. And that would be something that certainly we should stress with our, our scientists that are interacting in social media. Catherine, did you want to make a comment on that? Or make it? I, I would just agree with that, that you always have to think about who you're talking to. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been really interesting. I think we've got a lot of things on the table to keep us talking about uh, frictions and momentum as we go through the rest of the workshop. Please join me in thanking both our panelists here and the two panelists who are with us virtually. So we'll move to coffee break for how long? 15-minute coffee break. <laughs>